six, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon, in the event that she loses her Starleaf connection. Okay. Then, the meeting, members, um, was originally scheduled to take place on the 15th of December. We had to postpone that due to plenary business. And then there was a list of issues um, submitted by members for discussion with the Minister during the session, and they are listed in the Clerk's memo at pages five and six of the meeting pack. And of course, it doesn't include members raising other issues um, that they may wish to do, time permitting, with the Minister. So at this stage, I will ask the broadcasting team if they can bring in uh, the official, the Minister, Permanent Secretary. Um, so let me formally welcome to the meeting um, the Minister of Justice, Naomi Long, and Peter May, the Permanent Secretary, uh, to the Department of Justice. They're joining us via the Starley facility. Uh, you're both very welcome. Um, the session will be reported by Hansard, and then a transcript will be published on the committee webpage in due course. So, members, uh, we intend to cover each of the issues in the order that's been outlined. The Minister will make uh, brief uh, remarks at the beginning of each of those issues, and then I'll open it up to members to ask some uh, questions. So, the first uh, issue uh, that we will go on to uh, discuss with the Minister was just to get an update on the Department's legislative uh, programme. The relevant papers for members are pages 7 to 10 of your meeting pack. So, Minister, can I hand over to you, to you at this stage, and you're, you're welcome to the Justice Committee. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Chairman and Committee, um, and I'm appreciative of the opportunity to update the Committee today. Um, on taking up role as Justice Minister, I brought forward quite an ambitious legislative plan for the remainder of the mandate in areas where there was widespread political agreement on the need for new legislative provisions. I am pleased that as a result of our collaborative efforts, the first of the planned bills, the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, reached the final stage yesterday and should receive royal um, assent in the coming weeks. The Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill was introduced on the 2nd of November and is now at committee stage. I am pleased to confirm that the Protection from Stalking Bill was also introduced to the Assembly yesterday, with the second stage likely to take place in early February. We are due to discuss the next bill in my plan programme, the Personal Injury Discount Rate Bill, as part of today's conversation, so I don't propose to say anything further in that respect at this stage. And that leaves then the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, um, drafting of which is currently ongoing. Subject to the necessary executive approvals, I intend to introduce the bill to the Assembly in the spring. The bill will increase public safety by legislating to deliver aspects of the Gillen Review of serious sexual offence cases the outcome of a review of child sexual exploitation, including a new offence of upskirting and downblousing, um, provisions relating to bail and remand arrangements for children and young people, and a number of standalone provisions that will help create a more effective and efficient justice system. Introduction of the bill in spring 2021 should ensure that the bill can complete its assembly scrutiny and passage before the House rises in March 2022 for the next local elections. Hopefully, we'll not be dealing with that in March, um, because we'll probably be slightly distracted with the election campaigning. But are there any of those pieces of legislation you know, that you're, you're, if you had an amber warning system, that are red flagging, amber flagging, or at this stage, are you still confident that that legislative programme, um, subject, of course, to this committee, um, working with you constructively, which I'm sure it will, um, being achieved? Based on uh, certainly based on our time frames, we're still operating within the time frames that were planned, and that gives me a certain degree of confidence. Of course, as you rightly say, it will depend on good collaborative and cooperative working um, between the committee and the department. I think, in particular, with relation to the miscellaneous provisions bill and our experience, I suppose, of trying to manage um, changes to the domestic abuse provisions bill in a constructive way. I think it would be helpful if members do have areas that they feel they would like included within the bill, or the committee indeed have areas that they would like to see included within the bill, that we could get those flagged as quickly as possible so that the department can see um, what support um, in terms of drafting and policy we would be able to provide for that, because I'm conscious that if the bill becomes unwieldy, um, it may be very difficult to make its full process through. And I also recognise, as does the committee, um, the, necess the need for us to have proper scrutiny, um, but also um, robust policy um, to back up legislative change. So I think provided we work co cooperatively, 
um, and try to identify areas that members may have a particular interest in at an early stage, um, then there is still the opportunity for this to be delivered. But it is, nevertheless, um, I think quite a demanding programme of work. Um, and I think that it's one that if we manage to make it through to the end, I think we can all be suitably proud of our contribution in that regard. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, know, I know the Minister had said in relation to the personal injury discount rate that obviously we're going to be addressing that later in the meeting. But just in terms of the actual programme itself, if we were to have a circumstance where it was not accelerated passage, I mean, the, the committee will take our responsibility seriously and we'll do what we have to do, but will the department be able to manage all of what is left without accelerated passage? Well, our reasons for seeking accelerated passage, and we'll come to this, are not because of capacity issues within the department, because it would still require the same amount of work. And in fact, that work would have to be condensed over a shorter period. So it's not one around capacity. It isn't even one around capacity for the committee. That's a matter for the committee to manage, not for me to manage. The reason for seeking accelerated passage in that case is because of the urgency um, of the legislative change that we're trying to bring forward and our belief that it is necessary in order that outstanding cases can be settled and that we can reach, we can reach if you want to describe it as such a steady state um, rather than a position which will be subject to further change because I think that isn't in anyone's interest. So um, it isn't a capacity issue, um, just to answer the question directly, although obviously it may well impinge um, on the committee's capacity, but that's a, a judgment obviously for yourselves to make rather than me. Thank Sorry, Chair, just to thank the Minister for the clarity around that because there was some concern that it, it might impinge on the, the miscellaneous provisions bill, but if, if we're getting assurance that that would not be the case, then I appreciate that clarity. Thank you. Certainly not from a departmental point of view, um, because the drafting um, the drafting of all of the, these different elements are, as you know, um, separate and being dealt with separately. Um, I mean, uh, however, there are, as you'll be aware now, there would be three bills in front of yourselves for scrutiny and then a fourth would arrive. So there may be issues that you wish to consider in, re in respect of capacity, but from a departmental um, perspective, it, it would make no tangible difference. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, listen, we've pivoted onto that issue, so we might as well, for completeness, just deal with it in terms of the personal injury discount rate. I suppose, Minister, I wasn't going to labour this one today now because we did get an update. I know members won't have received it. Um, it came in an hour ago, um, and it will be on the agenda for Thursday's meeting to allow the committee to consider that and provide a response. So I didn't intend to, to cover that now in any real detail, as I previously anticipated doing. Um, but if you want to just make some brief comments on that, Naomi, and then um, I think we'll park it so the committee can then consider the, the written letter that was received just earlier today. Of course. Um, well, yes, I mean, in terms of the update on the personal injury discount rate, um, the committee had written to the department um, to ask if the permanent secretary intended to review his decision not to set the personal injury discount rate until a new legal framework was in place. Um, this was in light of legal proceedings in relation to the decision. Um, I can confirm the department is defending the applications for a judicial review of that decision. And as the matter is now before the courts, I wouldn't be able to say anything further on that. Um, however, we do recognise that there is an urgency. This is a matter um, that has been um, an issue for some time. Um, and therefore, we would be keen um, to be able to get a final position in terms of how the personal injury discount rate will be set in future in place. Um, and so there is a degree of urgency to that because, as the members will be aware, um, there is urgency in terms of settling the particular cases and claims that would fall under its remit. Um, perhaps if I could pass over just to the Permanent Secretary in respect um, of his role in that regard, um, it may be helpful if members do have any questions. Sure, thank you. I'm very happy to respond to questions from members. Um, the, the, the decision um, not um, to review at this stage is based on the fact that um, we are still uh, seeking to move forward to the timescales that I had envisaged when I took the decision last autumn. If there was a material change to those timescales, then obviously we would need to look again at whether or not a review is needed. That's without prejudice to what the outcome of that review would be. Um, and for 
for clarity. Last time, Peter, when you were up, um, the department indicated that there were four pre-action protocol letters. Is that still the number that has translated into the JR action, or is that increased? It's still um, And has there been any date set for a court hearing in respect of this? No, there's no specific date, although we think there may be um, a, a hearing in February. Okay, well, I, I'm not going to labour it because we'll put it on the agenda for Thursday's meeting in terms of this amount of letter that has been received. So, is there any other members want to ask questions on either the personal injury discount rate issue or the legislative programme, or we're happy that we move on to the, the next issue on the COVID-19 regulation? Okay. okay, Minister, do you want to just give a, a, a briefing then on the... Um, aspects of the COVID-19 regs around enforcement, but in particular I think we were keen to get an update um, from the Perm Secretary in terms of the task force that's being led, you know, the element that he is leading uh, around this issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, regarding the issue of enforcement of COVID restrictions, um, committee members are aware of the regulations now make it an offence for someone to leave the place that they normally live without reasonable excuse. The PSNI also have the power to direct people to return to their home, as was the case in the week starting on Boxing Day for the curfew period. PSNI will continue to use the four E's of engage, explain and encourage um, in the initial stages and enforce as a last resource, uh, resort. Um, to ensure adherence um, with the regulations as their main approach. We will not judge, obviously, the, ex the success of the regulations by how many people receive fines. I think that would be um, the wrong way to approach this. However, where there are blatant breaches of the regulations, the PSNI will ensure enforcement activity is rigorous. Other statutory organisations, such as local councils, also have responsibility for compliance and enforcement, and they too will be playing their part and are playing their part um, in that role. Um, the updated regulations mean that if you're away from home without reasonable excuse, you can be subject to a £200 fixed penalty notice or a fine of up to £5,000 if your case goes to court. While there's anecdotal evidence and media coverage of specific examples of non-compliance, PSNI colleagues are reporting high levels of adherence and their engagement with the public remains very positive on these issues. The COVID task force is being led by the Executive Office and they report directly to the Executive Office Committee on the work of the task force. But as you have referenced, Peter is here today to respond to specific questions that you might have on the adherence work stream on which he is leading on behalf of the Executive Office as opposed to um, on behalf of the Department of Justice. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter, do you want to provide an update in terms of that work stream that you're involved in leading? Yeah, certainly. So um, uh, I've, I've drawn together a, a group of, of people from across different organisations to assist with the work. So that would include the police, the public health agency, Department for Communities, the Executive Office, Department of Health, representatives of local government through SOLAS, and um, we've just brought on the uh, Department of Finance Innovation Lab as well, as a, uh, because they have some behavioural uh, science uh, support uh, within within the Innovation Lab. Um, the work we're doing um, has a number of different elements. So we're looking to develop an evidence base uh, that identifies uh, what the experience is on the ground, uh, and in particular where the biggest challenges in relation to adherence are, uh, and also looks to see whether there is learning from elsewhere in the world, particularly. Uh, comparable democracies uh, in, in terms of what has been effective. Uh, we've been asked specifically by the, um, uh, the, the, the chief scientific advisor to look at two specific issues, one of which is self-isolation, where I think it's widely recognised that the levels of um, uh, compliance with uh, or adherence to self-isolation rules are, are low. And secondly, to look at the question of whether we could develop a, a more community champions to help uh, spread uh, the message. Um, we're also working at uh, how the message comes across and how we can create social norms uh, as to the way in which people are, are, are approach adherence. I think, as the Minister referenced, if, if there's a focus almost exclusively on the very small numbers of people uh, who aren't adhering, then that almost feels as if it is a norm and it's something that then people think with well, other people are doing it why wouldn't i but 
the reality is that we're having really high levels of adherence at the moment and we need to recognise that and to build on that. So overall, I would say, while the work, uh, yeah, there's a lot of work going on, I don't think there's going to be one big measure that somehow transforms this. I think it's going to be a lot of small steps that we look to take uh, that try incrementally to make a difference. And obviously, as the pandemic takes its course, so the challenges in relation to adherence are likely to change over time, and we will need to be uh, agile enough to react to that. So I hope that's a bit of an update uh, as chair. Okay, thank you. There's definitely aspects of that I would be interested to, to hear about around the behavioural analysis and, and what works and doesn't work, particularly across other um, democracies, um, because it's important that we do the right thing, not just to be seen to be doing something, and sometimes actions can be counterproductive, albeit with, with the right intent, but if actually the evidence shows that it's being counterproductive, then people need to recalibrate and adjust, so there's definitely aspects of that I would be keen to, to get more information on once that piece of work has concluded. Um, just two issues briefly for me. One has been an ongoing discussion around the power of entry for police officers in people's homes to check if uh, they have been complying, um, if, if that can be touched upon. And the other one that has been quite topical has been the 10 miles being a matter of guidance and what consideration um, is being made for that to be a legislative requirement. Um, I suppose, to, to be fair, um, that's not something that I personally support, but I'm just asking the question what would be the implications of actually making that enforceable? Well, I think um, if I can answer on the 10 mile issue first, um, Chair, I mean, I think as I discussed when I appeared at the ad hoc committee, there are obviously pros and cons. We looked at a number of different ways that travel could be restricted in regulations, um, but most of them involve, uh, I think, a disproportionate impact on people's personal freedoms so um, th that are out of proportion to the risk and that is always the key balance that needs to be made in terms of health regulations because we do already have quite intrusive powers in terms of the health regulations and the coronavirus regulations but it's important that we're able to demonstrate that further restrictions are actually required and proportionate. Um, with respect to the 10 mile travel guidance, that was really there to assist people who were asking the question, well, what do you mean by local and what sort of restrictions do you expect me to follow? Because people who genuinely want to follow the rules are seeking that kind of advice. So the 10 mile advisory, I suppose, was to give people some indication of what we deemed to be reasonable in terms um, of travel for exercise. There has been, as you know, um, quite a debate around the travel for exercise piece. Um, initially, it was exercise from your own front door, but we do know that that can create um, some genuine challenges for people who live in rural communities, um, who perhaps have disabilities or mobility issues, people um, who have sensory impairment or autism spectrum disorders that may mean that they are used to exercising in a particular place and wouldn't be comfortable doing so um, elsewhere. And for a whole host of reasons, um, we believe that providing people with flexibility to be able to exercise as often and as much as they can, but also in places that will bring them some degree of pleasure and comfort was important. But it, the overarching guidance, if you like, um, restricts large gatherings in places is that people should not remain somewhere where it is extremely busy, congested, where there are a lot of other people because of the risk um, of social distancing breaking down. And obviously, the closer to home you stay, the less risk there is of you having contact. So it's important, I suppose, in, in terms of the guidance. We looked at a number of options in terms of potential restrictions, things like saying that you could not move outside of your county boundary. But that would lead to all sorts of anomalies. I mean, as somebody who lives just across um, the County Antrim line in Belfast, I wouldn't be able to go to the city centre, but I would be able to go to Newry, which seems slightly perverse given one is three miles away and the other considerably further. So I think that there are anomalies like that that made us think that perhaps that wasn't the best way forward um, and rather that we would be better to look at something which gave people a degree of flexibility. I think the difficulty with putting the 10 miles in regulations is that there could be circumstances where 
the nearest safe place for someone to walk um, might be 12 miles away um, in order that they're able to walk with someone um, that is a part of their bubble and so on. Uh, and you start to get into, I think, very intrusive um, policing around those issues um, rather than actually trying to get people to adhere. So to date, the executive hasn't asked for it to be placed in regulation. Uh, we will be, as you know, reviewing all of the regulations on executive this Thursday, and I wouldn't want to prejudge the outcome. But we do recognise that there are challenges um, when it comes to the issue of how um, we would take these things forward. With respect to um, the issue about powers of entry, um, I mean, we have been advised um, very strongly that the powers of entry um, are available um, to the police in order to be able to enforce um, this. These are health regulations and the powers of entry are based um, on the Public, um, and the public Protection Act, I think, uh, Public Health Protection Act um, from 1967. Um, in Northern Ireland and so my understanding certainly and, and the advice that we have received is that the police can enforce this. Moreover, I think the police have also received the same advice um, and so I mean I know there's been a degree of public discourse about it um, but we are we are confident that the information that we have received is accurate. In terms of if I could just add to what the Minister has said, uh, my understanding is that there is now a legal challenge in relation to the powers of entry that's a challenge to the PSNI and the Department of Health. Um, in the first instance, we're a notice party to those proceedings, uh, but that legal challenge will be defended robustly. And Peter, do we know where that legal challenge has emanated from? Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen the actual um, the notice of the challenge to be able to... I, I know anecdotally, but I'm, I'm not sure that I, I don't have the evidence in front of me to... To want to, to say publicly, I think at this stage. Okay. Okay. Well, Minister, I, I certainly on the, the the guidance issue and and that I, I would agree with your balanced assessment as to what is have, having to be considered and weighing all of that up. Certainly, if I look at Lisburn, you know, it is split right down the town centre again with County Antrim and County Down, um, yeah. and and that would just just wouldn't be possible as you cross over if you're familiar with the union bridge as you come in off the, the motorway you you then cross yeah. the, the county boundaries and then we've also county armagh um uh, towards the the moira mcgabry side of the constituency so um yeah okay well listen let me bring in gordon dunn has indicated he has a question on this thanks chair and thanks minister for your presentation to date um on the issue of face coverings that we covered in detail at the ad hoc committee, I think we all obviously welcome the initiative taken by the supermarkets. I don't know what your opinion is on that, and I would be interested just to see the feedback you've had. But uh, it certainly was something that exercised a lot of constituents, that they went into supermarkets, and in the main, um, they genuinely wore their masks, but there was an element of people in there that were not, and no one seemed to be doing much about it. So. I understand now that the supermarkets do have the responsibility to to enforce it or at least encourage the wearing of masks and uh, do they have any further powers in relation to that but um, we do I believe welcome the progress that has been made on that. The other point just is on um, the point that the chair mentioned about the, the rights of entry. I am aware of uh, house parties that have happened certainly within the North Down area in the earlier phases of the, the lockdown. Is there any evidence of uh, of house parties now continuing? And I know the police were proactive on it and in many ways I suppose reactive as well to be fair but uh, it is something that is of concern and a risk area and I believe um, we need to be certainly doing all we can to discourage it. Yeah, well, I mean, on both, I would agree uh, with the member. I mean, first of all, with respect to supermarkets, as you know, um, it has always been my contention um, that retailers can take responsibility for this um, in much the same way as they do um, when it comes to policing things like the no smoking indoors um, uh, laws, where if someone were to light a cigarette in the aisle of one of the supermarkets, they would be removed from the store um, and told not to return until they'd either extinguished their cigarette um, or smoked it outside. 
um, and only if that person became difficult or obstreperous or was assaulting a member of staff would it lead to the police having to be called. I think the reason that it, it has become such a totemic issue is because it's a very visible sign of people breaking the rules. Um, when you see people obviously um, out walking, you don't know if they're family or not, so it's hard to know whether they're adequately socially distanced and so on. When you see people at shops, you don't know if what they're purchasing is essential and so on and so forth. But when you see people out without a mask and when you see them in large numbers without a mask inside supermarkets, um, it starts then to suggest that there's just widespread lack of adherence. I think that if you now look at the supermarkets and even I think over the last number of months, we have seen a marked increase in the number of people actually wearing face coverings. And I think that that is for the good. Um, I also think that the supermarkets stepping in and making it clear that they are going to do it. I've noticed even a number of smaller retail venues in my own constituency now have signage outside asking people to put on a mask and you do notice people nipping back to the car to get one. It's often just that people um, have forgotten to take their mask with them and they go back and they get they get the mask and go in. So I think all of those things are really helpful and I think much preferable actually to heavy handed enforcement because the difficulty of course with enforcement is that you end up then with police stopping people who have a genuine reason. And whilst there are only a small number of genuine reasons why you wouldn't wear a mask, obviously you wouldn't want somebody, um, for example, with sensory issues um, to be kind of questioned by the police about why they're not wearing a mask because of the, the problems that that could create. So I think that if people adhere to the, the guidance and if retailers support that, I, I think that that's a much better solution and it's one that I very firmly welcome. In terms of rights of entry and the issue of house parties in particular, there has been an ongoing issue um, with gatherings in people's homes and that remains a, 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 an area of concern, particularly on up to Christmas and in the new year period, the police um, gave that quite a lot of attention and focus and will continue to do so um, and are engaged in preparatory work also um, in terms of, for example, preparation for St Patrick's Day and things like that because, again, house parties are a particularly difficult area to police given that they're in people's homes but they are also a particularly high risk activity um because obviously there you have large numbers of people lack of social distancing um and you often have quite confined space uh, where the transmission of the virus is likely um, to be much more um, ready, uh, readily happening than in other more um, well-ventilated situations. So for all of those reasons, I think it's important um, that house parties are dealt with. But I think the member is correct to say that the police have been very active in and around the issue of house parties and have um, issued a significant number um, of notices um, on those who have organised house parties and also those who have been in attendance. And I know that they would intend to continue to keep that under review because it is one of the areas that we would be concerned um, is, is a major spreader and can create those kind of super spreader events. Okay, thanks, Minister. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Is there any other members on this issue? Members content, then we'll move on. Okay, then, Minister, we'll go on to the EU exit and justice-related issues. Thank you. Um, well, the trade and cooperation agreement reached between the UK and the EU on the 24th of December includes provisions for law enforcement and judicial cooperation in criminal matters. The agreement on justice and security is perhaps better than might have been anticipated at the beginning of the negotiations. It provides for fast-tracked warrant-based extradition, the sharing of criminal records and biometric data on DNA, fingerprints and in future vehicle registration details. It also allows for the continued transfer of passenger name records for EU uh, flights, inter-EU flights and continued participation by the UK in both Europol and Eurojust. Um, the agreement includes improved timescales for access to mutual legal assistance using the Council of Europe Convention and supports cooperation on asset freezing, money laundering and cyber crime. The downside of the agreement and the most notable downside is that the UK will no longer have access to the SIS2 Schengen information system that allowed for real time sharing of data on wanted and missing persons. Um, and bearing in mind that the Irish were just about to um, come on board with Schengen, that is a particular um, frustration. However, there is provision in the agreement to allow the UK to enter into bilateral agreements with individual EU states to develop similar functionality. 
um, and the agreement also allows for the continued transfer of personal data for criminal justice purposes for a period of up to six months, during which time a data adequacy agreement should be agreed, and we remain hopeful that that will be the case. Um, I have spoken um, with um, with the Lord Chancellor, um, Robert um, Buckland, and he again is optimistic um, on the issue of getting um, a data adequacy agreement. In summary, I think the agreement ensures continued cooperation with the EU on key areas, and it also allows for bilateral agreements to plug gaps and enhance the current arrangements. This, I think, will be particularly um, important to ensure continued cooperation with the rest of Ireland. And um, I think that's something that we want the UK government um, to take up as a priority uh, when it comes to bilateral agreements. Um, I accept the current reality um, that we are no longer part of the EU and the justice and security um, deal that has now been agreed. It is a comprehensive one and it allows for key EU justice measures to continue, albeit in a different form. The new arrangements are bedding in in terms of new IT arrangements and processes. Partner organisations in Northern Ireland, including the PSNI and PPS, report no significant issues. That's a notable achievement, I think, considering the time available to introduce the new arrangements. And credit has to go, I think, to local criminal justice organisations and colleagues in the Home Office for their support. Civil and family uh, judicial cooperation does not feature in the trade and cooperation agreement. The UK has applied to rejoin the Lugano Convention in its own right, with the decision on that application awaited. And again, I have been in correspondence um, with Robert Buckland in regard um, to Northern Ireland having access to that um, as part of the overall deal. OK, thank you. Rachel Woods, um, I'll bring you in at this point. Thank you, and thank you, Minister. Um, I had uh, wanted to raise this, obviously, before. Um, we knew anything about a deal um, before Christmas, uh, which is obviously welcome, but um, I noticed yesterday in the Chamber there was questions asked with regard to the um, EU exit and about bids to finance, and a note in one of your responses, I think it was to Dr Archibald, with regard to the PSNI having made bids for additional resource, but the, the Department hadn't put any bids around Brexit, but you're waiting on the Treasury coming back. I'm just wondering if you could um, give us a wee bit more detail on on what your what the tr the role of the Treasury is. You're making a bid for uh, Westminster funding for Brexit for the PSNI. No, the, the point that I was making was that um, with respect to the funding for the PSNI, um, they got additional funding um, for Brexit, which has initially the indications are that that will not be continued on um, into the new financial year. Um, that would have significant impact on policing and particularly on police numbers because that funded just over 300 new officers. Um, so they were able to increase um, the size of the police force essentially um, by using some of that Brexit funding. So um, we have now made representations um, to the Department of Finance um, who are in turn discussing with Treasury the need for that money to continue on into next year because clearly uh, whilst Brexit in the initial phase has happened and we're now out of the transition period there will still be challenges going forward um, as these new rules bed in um, and there will be new opportunities for organised crime and others um, to exploit um, as the various derogations that exist for the first three months, the first six months and so on um, start to disappear. And so it's important that the PSNI continue to be adequately resourced to deal with those challenges. And that's the money to which I was referring um, in terms of it being for Treasury, because it doesn't come through the Department. Of, it comes through the Department of Finance, but it doesn't come from the normal block grant. Thank you, Minister. And then if the money isn't uh, forthcoming from Westminster, would a bid be made um, from the Department of Finance here to fund the officers and the PSNI? Well, we will obviously have to discuss that um, with the Department of Finance, but um, you will be aware of the budget statement um, yesterday afternoon um, and the very limited finances that are available um, to the Department of Finance. And as with every other bid, we would have to go through the normal processes. So it would be a matter really then, I think, for the Chief Constable also um, to look at the resources he has available to him um, and make a decision as to what his priorities might be uh, within whatever budget um, is able to be achieved. Um, but we would obviously have those conversations once we're clearer about what happens um, from uh, the Treasury side in terms of Brexit funding. 
Okay, so could we be looking at a situation where there is a reduction in officers or not meeting the new decade new approach commitments in terms of increase of officer numbers then? Well, as you're aware, the new decade new approach uh, commitment had no date attached. Um, so it's a, it's a, there was no date by which it had to be achieved. Um, and we continue to work um, with the PSNI in terms of the um, outline and strategic business cases. Um, on that matter, but obviously the demand for new officers um, and the demand for additional officers is one that really stems from the chief constable. And so um, I'm really, I suppose, uh, I'm really following his lead uh, when it comes to that. And he will obviously want to balance um, for himself uh, what the priorities are, for example, between that and the digitisation um, processes that he's looking at for the PSNI and indeed some of the plans that he has more widely on new estate. Um, and once he gets to um, an agreement on that, then we will obviously uh, work with him and with the Department of Finance to ensure that he has the resources he needs. But I think members do need to be aware that it is a very challenging budget settlement. Um, and unless there are significant changes to it, um, we're likely to face, a, at best, a flat cash situation um, in all departments. Um, and that will be challenging um, in terms of what we were able to achieve um, by way um, of additional funding for policing or indeed for any of the other agencies um, that sit within the Department of Justice's remit. Thank you, Minister. Um, let's hope that funding is forthcoming from Westminster um, in that case. My final question is just uh, regarding the data adequacy agreement. Is there a time scale that we're looking for on that? I know you'd said that you had been in contact um, ab about that with Westminster and also what role, if any, does the Department of Justice have on this agreement? We have no role whatsoever. This is an international agreement and therefore it remains a reserved matter for Westminster to negotiate. However, the Ministry of Justice um, have kept us involved and informed at all stages to ensure that the priorities of the executive and the priorities of the Department of Justice are reflected in the negotiating position of the UK government. And I think that has been reflected well in the outcome of the future security partnership. That was a lot easier, I think, to negotiate than the trade agreement because I think it was in everyone's interest and recognised widely to be in everyone's interests um, for that cooperation um, internationally to continue. Um, with respect to the time frame, um, we are hopeful um, that the transfer of personal data um, is allowed to continue for a period of up to six months. And so we would see the data adequacy agreement um, would need to take place during that six month period. That is achievable, although it is a complex area, um, it is achievable. Um, and I know that the Lord Chancellor has indicated that given that if you like all of the other issues have largely now been addressed and there is a, a deal in place, it will be simpler in many ways to focus on the issues of data adequacy and be able to move, th move those forward more rapidly. It was simply something that given the time constraints could not be got over the line given its complexity um, ahead of the 24th of December. Thank you, Minister. Members, anyone else on these related subjects? If not, we will go on to the legacy issues. Minister, if you want to pick up on the legacy and then Linda Dillon, you'd ask Thank for this issue. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, turning to legacy, um, I remain seriously concerned that government's move to distance itself from Stormont House um, agreement and its proposed institutions leaves the justice system here seriously exposed. The department has not been funded for legacy investigations and resources have had to be diverted from frontline services to deal with the significant backlog of outstanding cases. In the absence of any meaningful engagement on the way forward, the justice system continues to bear the burden of outstanding legacy investigations. My department is simply not funded to progress the volume of legacy investigations that are queuing for attention. The current work on legacy is being progressed by diverting funding from frontline policing and other services, and that is neither acceptable nor is it sustainable. We have put some resource into legacy investigations through increased funding for the Police Ombudsman's Office and for legacy inquests. And we are now progressing um, the Lord Chief Justice's legacy inquest programme to clear the backlog of cases over a six year period. This work is supported by earmarked funding from within my department and through our budget allocation. I have written to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland to seek more clarity on his intentions and to ask whether during this hiatus we could draw some down some of the funding earmarked by um, HM Treasury 
for legacy investigation pressures. He has yet to formally respond to this request. When I met him recently on other matters, I pressed again for clarity on this point, and he made clear his view that the pressures my department is facing were a matter for the executive and that we needed to make tough decisions about how we allocate the block grant. I do not believe that it is in the interests of justice to simply park these cases. I have therefore written to my executive colleagues to seek a discussion on legacy funding and have stressed the need for us to take collective decisions about transitional funding to sustain the present day arrangements. I also made clear that I will not be seeking, nor is it practicable, to create the equivalent of an HIU um, within the PSNI. Um, and we've been very clear about that matter. Okay. Um, Mr Chairman, I'm not sure if you wish me to go on and specifically look at police ombudsman funding, which was a separate item on the agenda, um, or whether you wish me to wait um, until we have talked about the more general legacy issues. Well, if, if you want to bring up the police ombudsman, Linda had asked for both of those. So if you want to cover sure. the police ombudsman, then I'll bring Linda in and Linda, you can cover both those issues. Perfect. Um, well, look, I should first of all explain that funding pressures in relation to legacy are not unique to the Ombudsman. Um, as I've already made clear, the Department isn't resourced to meet the full costs of legacy, and I'm seeking to address that with executive colleagues. Last year, um, the Police Ombudsman's Office submitted a business case relating to historic investigations, outlining a funding need of £10.6 million over three years. The Department's currently engaged with the Police Ombudsman on this. In the meantime, members will note that the Ombudsman's Office budget has consistently been one of the most protected by the Department of Justice. In 2021, um, Oponai was provided with an operating resource budget uplift of 11% to fund pressures, which included funding towards pressure related to disclosure and the significant cases team. Funding towards legacy inquest pressures has also been allocated to Oponai, um, around 275,000 allocated in this financial year and 18,000 um, last financial year. I have a bid um, with the Department of Finance for historical investigations funding. Um, and as you know, those budget discussions continue on um, as things stand. However, executive colleagues have recognised that more needs to be done on this legacy area. And so I continue to work with them in order to try to ensure um, that in the in the hiatus in which we find ourselves, that we are able at least to make some progress um, in, in this space. But it is a very difficult space in which to operate without an overarching commitment um, from the UK government in terms of funding and indeed in terms of structures. Okay, thank you. Linda Dillon. Thank you, Chair, and just thank the Minister for her detail ar around these issues. I suppose the first thing to point out is that I think it's absolutely disgraceful, the derogation of duty that has been made out by the Secretary of State in relation not only to the general legacy, but also in relation, obviously, to the to the pension scheme and, and the funding of that. I think for the, the British government to say they have no responsibility of funding around these issues is absolutely disgraceful, but clearly that's an issue I think the Minister would probably agree with me on in general. Um, just in, in relation then to the historical investigations, and obviously funding is one issue, but it's not it's not the only issue. It, it certainly is around the police ombudsman's office, but it's not the only issue for the PSNA because they have the challenge of the fact that they cannot and they do not have the ability to carry out an Article 2 human rights compliant investigation. And, and that's the bottom line, and that's that's the real difficulty for the PSNA at the moment. And I know that some of these questions may well be um, more for the Chief Constable, but just in your own view, Minister, if you can sort of outline where you think the PSNA can go in relation to this, because the Chief Constable has previously outlined that they are very limited to how they can carry out these investigations. Obviously, John Boucher has carried out a number, and they have went to other policing organisations um, in England, but but they've been very clear, and in Scotland as well, but they've been very clear that there, there, there are limitations in this because there are big outstanding legacy cases across the water that they have to deal with themselves. Um, so, so they don't won't have the capacity to help us out in terms of legacy investigations. So where, where do we go without a HAU, without that kind of, of a 
a process where do we go in terms of legacy investigations and making them article two compliant well i think um you've outlined well um the challenges that we face in terms of how we actually proceed with legacy um, political agreement in itself can be difficult in this space, but I think the more challenging issue are the practicalities. Um, I think the Operation Canova um, kind of model is not one that is scalable, and I think that that's been made clear um, when we when we look at that particular model. Whilst it has worked well, um, it, it is not a scalable model because the difficulty, of course, is that getting um, sufficiently robust um, and experienced um, investigators um, is not easy when you have um, other police forces who are also working at capacity. And so the idea that there is a there is somewhere a storehouse full of um, experienced um, investigators who can come and take on those kinds of roles it is just not it's just not real. Um, and we need to be serious about that. There are, as you say, challenges with respect to the PSNI being able to undertake legacy investigations. Um, and so instead, now what we find is that the police are um, getting in receipt of a lot of legacy litigation. Um, the Ombudsman's Office, whilst of course it has a role in terms of dealing with legacy, um, it would be fair to say that the, the, the chief role of the Ombudsman's Office is to oversee current day policing. Um, and it was never really designed um, simply to look at historic matters. So I think all of those issues are challenging um, and not least the cost. Um, but I think the bigger issue for me and the one that I suppose all of us as elected representatives are concerned about is the impact on the victims who are still awaiting some kind of process that will allow them to hopefully receive justice or truth at the very least. Um, and that they continue to be denied that. And this is an ageing cohort of people. Um, and I think that we they've waited a long time. I think it's right that there should be a process in place. It will not be a perfect process. I've always accepted that whatever process comes forward will have flaws. It will be criticised by some. Um, and that is the inevitable consequence of our past. Um, and it is part of our legacy. Um, but I do think it's important that we at least make an effort to have a reasonable process with a reasonable prospect of bringing these to conclusion, these cases to conclusion in a time frame which will then mark a point in history where we can say we have dealt with those cases adequately and can then move forward. I think the problem on the justice system in the current day and the people's, if you like, confidence in justice is being um, impacted by the ability of the modern day justice system to cope uh, with the, the stresses of legacy investigations for which it was not designed. And I think that that's a very unfortunate um, outworking of not having a separate structure in place. I haven't given up hope um, of a separate structure being implemented. I think that that still remains um, the best way forward. And I believe the only practical way forward in terms of being able to resolve historic cases um, and allow people to have access to justice whilst acknowledging from the outset that at this remove from some of the events, getting any kind of clarity or justice will be incredibly difficult. But I think that at least if in an organised and properly funded process, um, people will have the opportunity to explore to what degree justice is available. Um, and perhaps to receive some sense of closure um, that the cases be their cases have been adequately dealt with and investigated, which perhaps they don't have at the moment. And I think it's hugely important um, that we do move on this, um, not just for protecting budgets, but actually more importantly, um, for protecting the cohesion of our community um, and the, the, the confidence in the current justice system. Can I just thank, thank the Minister for your answers. Can I just ask you, and, and and I appreciate your comments around that you haven't given up all hope on there on a separate structure. And I absolutely think there needs to be a separate structure, as do many, many families out there. Not all, but many. And I think that it's important that that structure is the HIU. I, I don't think we can just accept that there will be a separate structure. It has to be the HIU. HIU. That is what was consulted on. That is what families responded to in the consultation over 17 and a half thousand responses there's not many consultations that can say they got that number of responses to their consultation process and i just think to to move away from that to move away from what was consulted on and what families really found very difficult to respond to because it, it didn't you're right it didn't meet all of their requirements and for some of them it was a real challenge 
but they got an opportunity to respond. They got an opportunity to highlight the issues of concern for them. And now we find that the British government are just trying to move further and further away from it. And I just think it's important that the parties in, in the Assembly don't follow their lead and move away from it because this was agreed by all of the parties and by the two governments. And I think it's disgraceful that the British government are trying to move away from it. But I certainly would expect that the parties who agreed to it in our Assembly would stick by with what they agreed to and would stick by what the, the agreement they came to that was then put out to families and to all of those impacted and affected right across the board, right across our community. Not one section or the other. It was out there for everybody to respond to. And everybody got that opportunity to move forward in anything in any other manner with something that has not been agreed with the families or has not been consulted on with the families, I think would be a disgraceful action. I mean, as you'll be aware, um, Linda, and as the committee members will be aware, um, when the NIO published um, proposals for legacy arrangements um, in March 2020, it was very clear that the emphasis was moving away from justice and investigation to what I would say is more perhaps reconciliation and information recovery. Um, neither my officials nor I were consulted about that change in direction, nor did we have notice of the proposals until immediately before publication. In fact, we had no meaningful contact with the NIO on matters since the new decade new approach agreement was published. Up until that time, we had been working solely on the basis that the HIU was the only game in town and we were working in preparation um, for the HIU to be set up and for it to be the responsibility of the Department of Justice, um, at least in part to assist with that, given that it falls within the justice remit. Um, things went quiet and then suddenly we, we had this change of direction. I've made clear my objections and concerns to the Secretary of State, both in writing and in follow-up telephone conversations and have also said that it should not now be assumed that my department will take the lead in implementing any new proposals because these are a clear departure from that justice-based approach and that Article 2 compliant um, requirement. And I think that um, something that meets the needs of families and the requirements of Article 2, um, something that is justice-based, would, would reside within the department. But something that is reconciliation and information recovery doesn't naturally sit within justice and I've been clear with him. I've also continued to press him um, during recent discussions about greater clarity on proposals which as you will appreciate has been lacking and mm -hmm. also on the associated funding because as you know money was set aside um, in order that we could bring about the HIU and um, that funding is still apparently um, awaiting to be drawn down but there are no structures within which to draw it down. Um, again, we don't have any detail on that. So look, we do need to find a better way um, to, to deal with this for victims and their families. With respect to the Stormont House Agreement, it was an uneasy compromise. And I think all of us recognise that no party went away from the Stormont House proposals feeling that they um, had achieved everything that they wanted or that the proposals were ideal. There's always a degree of compromise in these issues and it is always very difficult. However, I do believe that when you get it to a point where parties were at least tacitly um, accepting that this was the best of the options available, um, I think that it was unwise to um, to interfere with that rather delicate ecology um, of agreement. Um, however, the damage I think has now been done and of course that has meant that people have reopened a lot of the debates that we had in the run-up to Stormont House um, that were never fully resolved um, and I think that that is an inevitable consequence of the uncertainty. I would hope that the Secretary of State will come back um, to the original proposals um, and look um, at what um, what is within those and the opportunity still to deliver because I suspect that by now um, he will have found that trying to get complete agreement on any new proposals um, is, is something of a, a mountain decline um, given how long we spent on the issue of legacy. And it may well be that by this stage he realises that however imperfect the Stormont House Agreement might have been, trying to achieve anything better may be beyond reach. So I I'm hopeful still that um, we will get to a point where we can get Stormont House. And if we can do better than Stormont House in some areas, if it can be refined and improved, well, I mean, I don't think any of us would want to resist that. Um, but I do think that we still need to focus on the issues um, of how we actually get Article 2 compliant investigations um, for families and allow people 
um, to receive what justice may be available to them and be able to move beyond this current um, position because I think the uncertainty around this is causing an enormous amount of distress. Thank you, Minister. I appreciate your answers. And then just in relation to the, the police ombudsman's office, finally, you've talked about you know some, some of the funding issues. Are there ongoing conversations about the potential for increased funding? And I accept everything about what you're saying around you know that it was not set up to deal with with all of the legacy issues we have and, and it can't but it, it certainly is the only form that many many families see currently that that is able to help them in some way so i think funding for that body in the absence of the hau is extremely important well we continue to work with executive colleagues and as i said before the budget um settlement is unlikely to be one that brings much comfort to any of us in any sector um, however, we will continue to look at where there is an opportunity, where there is scope um, to meet additional stresses um, within each of the organisations um, within within the department's um, remit. Um, but in reality, um, we, we need to, I suppose, be realistic about this having to be a cross-executive approach because on a flat cash basis, there isn't much scope within the department um, to reallocate funding. However, I do think that members of the executive generally are sympathetic to the issue um, around um, the need for additional funding um, for the office and therefore we continue in constructive discussions around that and hopefully uh, we'll be able um, to, to reach a more a, a constructive c conclusion, though it may not fully meet all of the demands um, that, that any organisation would make. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's... Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, Doug Beattie. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, Minister, thank you um, for, for, for what you've given us so far in regards to legacy. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't uh, intending to speak on, on this because it can be uh, incredibly emotive uh, and can quickly degenerate into something that we don't want it to be at. But I need to be absolutely clear and put on record. We do not support um, the, the, the Stormont House Agreement legacy mechanisms, and in particularly the HIU. And, 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 I, and I'm getting a little bit bored of people saying... Uh, that we do, uh, and, and we don't not support it other than for good reasons. And our good reasons are this, is that the HIU proposes that those who have had a historical inquiries team desktop review will not get an investigation. The injured, that is the limbless, the blind, the burned, the psychologically damaged, if there was no fatality, they do not get an investigation. And it's geographically fixed. So if you are kidnapped in Northern Ireland, taken across to the border in the Irish Republic and murdered, you do not get an investigation. And the, the whole in issue about information is the British government has said they will give all, every single item of information before investigation and only redact it after investigation before it goes to family reports. And the Irish government will redact it before investigation. And how do we stand in front of the Kingsmill families and tell them that they will not get the information to give them justice? So very real reasons why we don't support this, uh, Minister. Uh, and, and it's important that people understand that, that we don't not support it other than for good reasons. But can I raise this with you? Because it's something you said and I think is really, really important. And you're absolutely right, I've got to say. Uh, up Canover uh, is a good model. Um, I, I think it's, 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 it's been seen as, as good and has given huge confidence. But you're right, it's not upscalable. You can't just make it larger and say that's your legacy mechanism. Well, if we can't upscale Canova to 300 investigators, how do we upscale a HIU separate from the PSNI to 300 investigators? Well, I mean, there are a number of issues that you've raised, Doug. I think the first thing is that your reasons for objecting to the Stormont House Agreement, I think, are understood by us all. Um, and, I mean, you've highlighted exactly what I said, that it was an imperfect agreement um, and that it didn't cover um, everything that we would wish it to. And I think that that is inevitably going to be the case with anything that is brought forward. There is no um, there is no perfect solution to this. And so whilst I completely accept the points you raise are valid, um, I think unless we can find a way to deal with those issues, and I would prefer we dealt with them as addendums to Stormont House, 
um, rather than through an entirely new process. Um, I don't think we're going to make the progress that we need to make. And I don't think that all of the issues that you've raised are ones that would find any resistance, um, indeed, from other parties who helped um, along with your own to negotiate the Stormont House position. So I think that those are issues that as parties we can continue to progress with the Secretary of State and the Irish government. Um, and I don't think they preclude the Stormont House structures um, in terms of the overall and overarching approach. Um, the issue, of course, about uh, the operational independence issue and whether or not um, the PSNI would be able, people who had worked in the PSNI would be able um, to work in the HIU and its independence and so on. The structures that were provided were to ensure that there was operational independence and that was the key issue. So the organisational independence was the, the, the kind of key element in terms of allowing the HIU to function. Um, of course, there will be challenges in terms of structures and being able to bring forward um, appropriate levels of um, appropriate levels of staffing, which is why there was a set up period that needed to be allowed for in all of this. I suppose my disappointment is that this has been rumbling along for a very long time, and yet we still haven't even started that process. So yes, there are challenges, and I don't think any of us, Doug, would want to say that this is simple, or that Stormont House solved all the problems, or that there wouldn't be further groups of individuals who need attention and need their cases looked at and so on and so forth, because that would be untrue. But I think what we could have said, and I, I would say still, is that Stormont House Agreement was by far the best stab that we had at this. And I think that given, you mean, if you, if, you, if you follow your logic, unfortunately what it means is that no one gets that information, no one gets the investigation, because certain categories of people haven't been included within Stormont House. I would much rather implement Stormont House and then try to adjust so those additional um, cases can be considered rather than um, deny everybody the opportunities that Stormont House presented um, in, in waiting to get perfect. So it's again a case of making perfect the enemy of the good. But I have a lot of sympathy, obviously, for your concerns about it. And I know um, that they're strongly felt um, and that it's not just a, as a way of dismissing um, agreement or being contrary, because I know that's not a space you're in when it comes to victims' issues. Um, I just think I would approach it slightly differently. Um, but I do have sympathy, as I say, with the fundamental points you raise. I think, as I say, the structural separation um, of the HIU um, from the PSNI was the key issue in terms of it being able to be Article 2 compliant. And that's something that I think we would be we would need to work through. Um, because, as you know, the reason that there has been question raised about the compliance of the PSNI um, around Article 2 is because of its role as a successor body to the RUC as opposed to um, the PSNI in and of itself. And I think it, that will be um, a, a very complex issue um, if people then suggest that anyone uh, that anyone who comes from the successor body would also um, be incapable of bringing forward um, such investigations. And I don't think that that, that that would throw up clearly major sustainability issues. Yeah, um, can, I, can I just jump in? Uh, uh, Minister, thanks for that. And, and, and like I said, I, I guess I, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but I just want to make sure that was on record, that, that there's very good reasons why people don't support it. And actually... When you look at the delivery of justice for our people of Northern Ireland in regards to what happened in our past, regardless of what community they come from, actually what we're proposing is leaving tens of thousands of people without justice. Tens of thousands. Um, uh, but listen, I don't want to go down that, that, that rabbit hole, but can I ask you another very quick question, Minister, and I'm conscious of, of time. But the Troubles Permanent Disability Payment Scheme, and I'm really trying to use the proper title with this instead of the Victims' Pension Scheme, uh, which is giving off a completely wrong, uh, wrong understanding of, of, of what it's for. So the Troubles Permanent Disability Payment Scheme, um, this figure of £800 million is now being used as a figure, as a stamp as to how much it's going to, to cost. But I don't think that is accurate. I think that might have been an initial stab. But I don't think that that is as accurate uh, as, as we could be. Have we managed to do any work whatsoever to try and get a more accurate figure than, than the 800 million which is being used now um, to, to, to sort of scream for money? Well, I think there are two things, Doug. I mean, first of all, that 800 million figure which was quoted was, as I said at the time, the absolute upper limit of what we could expect um, the um, Troubles Disablement um, Payment Scheme um, to, to cover. Um, 
we had a range of figures um, that that were appropriate um, based on trying to scale up, if you like, from the original estimates, which were more accurate, around 165 million, um, and those related to um, the costs for um, serious disability, physical disability only, um, scaling that up in terms of some of the changes in the threshold, and then scaling it up also based on the likely numbers of people who could claim um, under psychological um, serious injury. So that figure, if you like, was an outer limit. I would expect, as I said at the time, for the actual figure to land somewhere between the two. And yes, government work has been ongoing uh, with TEO because obviously I'm my responsibility is the delivery of the scheme, but it, re it resides with TEO to do the assessment um, in terms of the, the injured um, and support for victims. And so they have been continuing to do work, um, and including with the Government Actuaries Office, to try to get a more, um, a more accurate figure, a more accurate estimate um, of what the scheme will in fact cost. And that it is, it is always going to be an estimate because this will be a demand-led scheme. So we won't know until we open for applications how many people will apply. We won't know um, until those are assessed. Um, how many of those people will be eligible and to what degree they will be compensated. So many of those issues, first of all, will be out of my hands, um, but also many of them will also um, be, be very much led by the applications process. But there is work being done um, with the government actuary and um, with TEO and others to try to get a firmer figure in order um, that we can have those conversations that we desperately want to have and need to have at this stage. Uh, with government, but unfortunately are finding it very difficult um, to, to get secured. Thanks, Minister, and I look forward to that work. I think it's really important because I think people are using that 800 million figure as a whip to beat uh, other people with, and it's, it's slightly unedifying that anybody will be arguing about this in regards to making sure that our, our victims get the money that they absolutely uh, deserve. Um, but listen, th th thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Emma Rogan. Thanks, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. No problem. Um, thank you. Um, thanks to the Minister for, for your update so far um, today. Look, mine's more of a, a comment rather than a, a, a question, to be honest, around the, the, the pension um, for victims. It's just to be mindful that the need to keep a victim centred Anything that happens around the victims' pensions, you know, you need to keep victims at the heart of it. And when you're discussing it in, in TEO or, or with the British government or any any anywhere, victims need to be included in that conversation. Um, sometimes victims feel that anybody that I have spoken to, and even in, in my own family, that um it, it's only a second a second thought. They need to be centre stage of this. They need to know what's going on. So it, it's just a comment rather than a question today. Well, I mean, just to respond, because I think it's a very important point, um, I have made it clear that victims are at the heart of what we're doing in the Department of Justice and the team who are taking this forward are very conscious of that vulnerability. Um, we, as a result, have uh, have been engaging directly uh, with the, the forum um, and listening very carefully to their views. I have also had regular meetings um, with different victims' organisations and groups um, and have also encouraged those individual victims who may not be part of any of the organisations or groups um, to register with the department in order that we can keep them updated. Um, we've done that both via meetings, um, but also we've been doing that via written correspondence um, on a regular basis with victims' organisations, which we've published on the website, so that people are able to keep abreast of what's happening and be reassured about how this is taken forward. Um, obviously, at this stage, um, considerable progress has been made. We are still on target um, for an early March um, opening for applications. But I mean, I think what, what Doug has raised and what others have raised with respect to, to funding it is a key issue. I mean, I, I want to see um, the, the fund, I want to see this opened um, for applications in March. I want to see the processes uh, working well. But I want to know that if people apply, there is money there to pay. And I know that in conversations that I've had with executive colleagues, we are absolutely committed to ensure um, that we will uh, that this will be paid that the victims the, the money will be there um, and we are working with the UK government as best we can to try to ensure that they take up their um, 
portion of responsibility in all of this. Um, but we do not, any of us in the executive, want to um, let the victims down at this late stage, given the good progress that has been made um, since the department was designated to take this on. And I mean, if, if it's helpful to members, we'd be happy to provide them with an update on the pension scheme. Um, maybe just even a, a short letter um, just to update them on where we stand now. Okay, thank you. Chair, just on that, I think we do welcome Minister the progress that has been made and the assurance has given us on, the, on what has been done in relation to the processes and procedures for the pension scheme. Uh, I think that is good and, and we, we welcome your, uh, your drive and determination on this. I think it's, it's, it is, is most welcome. Um, just uh, last evening, there, the issue seemed to come up again in the executive or in the chamber in relation to the budget, the funding pr issue, and it has been kicked around again, and obviously it's back very much with, the, with our government uh, in the mainland. So um, it is important, and the points have been well made, that we, we, we do try and get this issue resolved, and uh, it's most disappointing that, that we have not got a commitment on the funding to date. And uh, certainly we shall, will be using all our influence we have within the executive to try and get that moving. But can you give us an assurance that, that, that all uh, levers will be pulled in relation to trying to get this over the line in good time for, the, for the, those innocent victims that have long overdue this support? Well, I mean, I can give you assurance that I will leave no stone unturned in terms of trying to get a resolution to this. And the sooner the better, because I think the ongoing debate in the public in the public arena actually causes distress and anxiety to many of the victims who hope to be able to benefit um, from this scheme. And the last thing that I want is for them to have to go knocking on doors and campaigning and begging for the, what is theirs of right. And I don't think that's either fitting or appropriate after it's taken us such a long time to get this far. I know that the First Minister um, raised the issue when we discussed the budget. As you know, the funding would go initially to the Executive Office and they have responsibility for bidding for it. Um, it would then be transferred to the Department of Justice to disperse um, under the scheme. Um, and it was raised um, by the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, during the discussions on the budget. Um, and as you know, I have been working very closely with them because although ultimately it's their responsibility to find the money, as a member of the executive, I feel very much it's my duty to assist them in doing that because this is this is a matter of, of joint um, cooperation from all of the parties. It's something that we all have committed that we want to do. And it's something that I think we all have a role in terms of making representations to government. Um, and I know that there are others outside um, of the executive and the assembly, people in Westminster who have taken a genuine an interest in this issue, Peter Hayne and others, um, Margaret Ritchie, um, just to name two um, examples, as well as a number um, of other um, MPs and so on, in particular um, the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Louise High, um, with whom I'll be speaking later today, has taken a particular interest in the funding around this. And so I think if we can work together with the Secretary of State, with Treasury, um, and with the Department of Finance um, and um, the Executive Office, we are, it's not beyond our capability to find a way forward. And if we do so sooner rather than later, I think it would put a lot of minds at rest um, in terms of victims um, and their families who may be at this stage very nervous about whether or not this, this will be delivered. We have the capacity to deliver it. Um, we just now need the funding and it isn't beyond our capacity to get the funding in place either. Good, thank you. Just the appeal process that was talked about and has been um, has voiced raised issues with of concern with many people. Is that now in, being developed out and, and will be in a position to run once the scheme come, is put into place? In terms of the appeals process, if you mean um, the appeals, that, that kind of regular appeal against a decision, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, or is it the appeal that the Secretary of State talked about? Yeah, uh, about appeal, his the appeals like on decisions, individual decisions and individuals. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think all of those things are are, are under um, are under progress in the department. I mean, our key is um, to get the system ready in order that we can deal with applications, um, and then work is ongoing in terms of how the applications will be processed. And um, we now, as you know, have the interim president in place, and um, Nigel completing um, the 
are completing um, the panel um, appointments. Um, so we should be in a position to have the board in place. And many of these issues will then be for the board to shape in terms of how they take these things forward. But I mean, in terms of actual delivery, I mean, I had a briefing on this this morning. Um, there are no there are no areas. I suppose I would, if I was going to give it a rag rating, I would say it's an amber one, and that we're we're on target. Um, but it is, a, as you know, a high risk, high pressure pro, program pro, program. So we need to really keep our focus to make sure that we get it over the line, um, in good time. Um, and I think from our perspective, that's the key. Um, but there will still be a lot of work to be done, even when it has opened um, for applications, because there will still be a lot of work to do behind the scenes in order to ensure um, that all of those applications can be processed um, and that we're able then to deal with any um, appeals that might come forward from that. But all of that is in hand and working to a schedule, which hopefully we'll be able to deliver. I think the key in terms of public confidence is us being able to open the scheme um, at you know in the in the early stage of March because that's what we promised and committed to and I think if we can meet that deadline and have the funding in place that would be a major um, a major win in terms of victims feeling confident about the scheme and its delivery and I think it would prove to people that we can deliver on these complex issues uh, where we have the determination and where we really want to make things happen so I think that will all be resolved in good time. Good. Thanks very much for your reassurance, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Gordon. Um, there's two more issues that we need to, to deal with that Rachel had asked for, and we've only ten minutes left. So, I want to ask if the Minister can pick up on the Police Ombudsman report on the police handling of protests, and then the review of CSUs, and then I'll bring Rachel in, and then if other members are wanting to come back in, I'll, if we've got time, I'll allow members to do that. Thanks, Chair, and I'll try to be I'll try to be quick as I can without losing any of the detail. Um, in relation to the reports by the Police Ombudsman and the Policing Board, as you know, both reviews draw out the complexities of policing in a context where there are unprecedented laws restricting personal freedoms, which lead to a clear expectation on the part of the public that the police will act to tackle any non-compliance. And yet there are important human rights issues for individuals too. So both reports highlight important learning for the PSNI, and I know that the Chief Constable has taken those findings very seriously. It's also important to be fair to the PSNI in assessing the reports. I note the Policing Board assessed the PSNI's performance overall as good, and the Ombudsman concluded that while there was unfairness in how protests were policed, it was unintentional and not based on race or ethnicity of those who attended the BLM events. I think that we should all acknowledge the vitally important job that police officers have been doing throughout and continue to do and the very complex decisions that they need to make um, in real time, balancing their need to be seen to enforce the law against the human rights um, challenges that individuals face. And so I think it is a very complex environment and it is one um, that I'm glad both reports recognised um, in their findings. With respect to the use of um, current supervision units, um, I'd firstly want to say prison service takes its responsibilities for the safety and well-being of all the people in care, its care very seriously. Current supervision units play an important role in each of our prisons as places where individuals can be kept apart from the general population in the interest of good order and discipline or for their own protection. The work of prison service is regularly and robustly scrutinised by Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland and by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons, as well as the Prisoner Ombudsman. All three prisons have been subject to unannounced inspection in the last three years, and that has included the CSUs. Indeed, I visited the CSU at McGabry before Christmas, and I have to say I was really impressed with the staff that I met and the work that they do. They are dedicated, professional and completely focused on the very specialised role which they play in supporting people, often very vulnerable um, and volatile people within the CSU. However, the present service is open and transparent and I wanted to provide the highest levels of assurance to the wider community. So that's why I invited the Chief Inspector um, of Criminal Justice in Northern Ireland to carry out a thorough review of CSUs right across our prisons. The terms of reference for the review have been published by Sajini, um, and I think I signed off on sharing those with the committee earlier this week. So hopefully um, you will have received them or will receive them shortly. Um, work has already commenced and the Northern Ireland Prison Service are working closely with inspectors to supply them with all of the information necessary and make the arrangements for fieldwork in the context of COVID-19. 
It's anticipated the review will be completed and the report will be published in June. Thank you, Naomi. Rachel. Thank you. I um, appreciate that. Sorry, we have very few minutes. I will be very quick. Um, there are certain just very specific questions with regard to the Black Lives Matter protests and the report. I know that it sort of came out on the 22nd of December and obviously was... Um, people's minds were elsewhere um, but and I do know that Chief Khan has issued an apology over the handling of it in light of um, of the the uh, report but I'm with regard to the department um, and also the role of the health protection regulations what if any mechanism exists within the health protection regulations to rescind fixed penalty notices that have been issued there are none um, and then again, and my understanding, I mean, and I don't want to, I don't want to go off piste here, but my understanding from legal advice sought um, by another body, which um, I just happen to be aware of, is that the only way that um, any of the 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 actions that were taken on the day can be rescinded is through the PPS. Um, but I would need to seek um, clarity on that for myself, just to to be absolutely sure. Um, but that that's my understanding. Thank you, Minister. Appreciate that. I have um, written to the Chief Constable asking him if the police have any powers on that, but that's good to know um, with regard to the potential of the PPS. Um, in, in the same sort of um, understanding, is there any powers or any role of the Department for enforcement over fixed penalty notices? No, I mean, uh, the enforcement, I suppose, of fixed penalty notices would come to, um, would, would only really enter, uh, enter into the department's role uh, where someone fails to, to pay their fixed penalty notice, and that would really be a matter for the courts to take forward because it then becomes a criminal um, a criminal issue. So there isn't any role for us in terms of the either giving people fixed penalty notices, sending them, um, or dealing with people who haven't paid them. So, I mean, the, that's the, there's no appeal process within the department um, for dealing with those, um, either of the department's health or um, justice. And they are health regulations as opposed to justice regulations. So it's likely if any powers to appeal were to be included, it would be to the Department of Health rather than justice. Okay, thank you. And finally, in terms of the outcomes of both reports, I know one obviously policing board report, but what are the next steps for the department in light of these reports? Well, in terms of the recommendations, the majority of recommendations really um, were directed towards um, the police. And obviously the, the, the oversight of policing is a matter for um, the policing board itself. Um, you will be aware, of course, from um, previous um, reports of the police ombudsman that there are issues about how the police ombudsman is kept abreast with what the police um, service do in response to police ombudsman reports um, because there's no, I don't think there's any duty actually to report back to the ombudsman and it's one of the areas um, that I think that the ombudsman would be keen um, that we would address. But the policing board receive those reports as well and are able to then hold the police to account for implementation. In terms of the the recommendations in relation to um, the, the regulations themselves, I think that the key takeaway for all of us in, in that regard is the need, first of all, for the regulations that are introduced um, to be human rights compliant, to be proportionate um, and to be necessary. And that's something which we have taken um, very seriously from the outset, um, but also I think for them to be clear and well understood. And again, that's something that I think we are constantly trying to improve. This has been a very difficult period um, in terms of the executive and the speed with which we have had to legislate. You'll appreciate um, when we come to make um, regulations normally, um, it can take quite a few months um, for those regulations to come forward. We are doing this um, at a pace which is not um, the usual pace for producing regulations. And there are challenges attendant to that. Um, so it's really important um, that we learn from any errors or any um, misjudgments that we have made as well. Um, but I think the key takeaway was about clear communication, um, clear regulations, and making sure that people know exactly what is expected of them. Um, but as I say, the issue of, if you like, how you apply um, the balance between enforcement of the regulations um, and um, human rights um, challenges lies primarily um, with the Chief Constable because it is an operational um, matter rather than one that relates to the regulations itself, other than that we obviously in all cases look at the human rights implications of them um, as an executive when we introduce them.
thank you, Minister. I do appreciate the difficulties of you know making the regulations so quickly, and and then also with the time that the assembly gets to debate them, they've already been in or sometimes lapsed. So it it certainly is not not the ideal situation, but. Um, Absolutely clear, consistent communication is, is certainly something that we do need um, and people understanding what's going on. But I'll move on just to the CSUs. Um, I saw the terms of reference last Monday on the Gini website. Um, I'm just wondering who wrote the terms of reference? Was it um, the director of the Gini? It was, yes. Okay. Um, and also, if there, obviously the realities of COVID-19 and its effects on the prison service and, and placement of prisoners and staff and so on. Um, and I note in the terms of reference that there will be, you know, sort of realities of COVID-19 taken into account. But you know, will they be? Uh, will that be part of the, uh, the final report of what would have say happened before COVID-19 and effects on the prisons? Would that be looked at? I think that's something that you would have to ask the criminal justice um, inspector um, specifically, the head of criminal justice inspectorate, about because I wouldn't want to prejudge what she may decide to include um, in the final report. I think the issue with respect to COVID is specifically around um, some particular arrangements that would um, be necessary for field work because if you're bringing people in to do inspections, if you're bringing people in to observe, obviously there are additional complications in terms of um, making sure the prisons are COVID secure. Um, I don't think it would in any way hamper um, the ability to assess what happens within um, the units themselves um, or to be able to observe that. It's simply just that the arrangements would be perhaps more complex and onerous, um, but I think it would be best in terms of what might be the inclusion in the final report um, to raise them directly um, with the inspectorate because I don't think it would be appropriate for me to second guess what they may or may not reference in their final report. I appreciate that. Maybe my next number of questions might have the same answer, but I will <laughs> just uh, put them out for, um, for just to, to raise it. In terms of the um, instruction given by yourself to, to Jenny, um, will the review, w w was there an instruction given whether or not review would... Um, have stays over 15 days um, in breach of the UN Mandela rules. Was that part of the, the terms of reference or the, the instruction given to Sajini? The, the Mandela rules um, apply to um, solitary confinement and CSU is not solitary confinement, so it isn't, uh, it's not a relevant consideration. And I didn't give instruction to Sajini. Um, I asked them if they would inspect the CSUs and they drafted the terms of reference, so I didn't tell them what to include or exclude. Okay. Um, and last, just in terms of the role of the IMB, obviously they have a, a <coughs> huge role in terms of Rule 32 and um, a number of other rules with regard to um, isolation and, and, and se segregation, separation of, of prisoners um, and the use of the CSU. What is their role within this review? That would be a matter again for the Criminal Justice Inspectorate because again, I have tasked the Ginny to look at the CSUs. Um, it's up to them who they choose to engage with and as they do that job. But I mean, obviously um, they have previous experience um, of inspecting prisons, of inspecting the CSUs, both in terms of routine inspections, but also in terms of unannounced inspections, and will be aware of all of the different individuals and groups um, and organisations uh, with whom they may want to interface in order to make sure that their investigation is complete. But again, it's not something that I would wish to direct them on. It's a matter for them to take this out um, in terms of it being um, a, an independent investigation and, and clearly such. Okay. Um it's just after two, so I'll leave it there. I'll probably be in touch. Okay, thank you, Rachel. And I need to be in the chamber for question time, which started two minutes ago. So I know Linda has indicated she wanted to ask a question on this. Um, so I'm happy for Linda to take over chairing this, but I need to leave. So um, I'm not sure. Good I'm, luck with questions. Yeah, I know other members are going to have to leave too. So Linda, if you want to just wrap yours up, and if, if people want to continue, I'll let you chair it, but I, I need to go. Yeah, no, no problem, Chair. Thank you. Okay. okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, Karen. Thanks, Linda. Yes, so, Minister, um, some some of the questions that I had have actually been covered by Rachel, so I'm not going to go back over those. And I suppose just, I mean, I would say to the committee clerk, maybe we should write to Jenny in relation to those particular questions, and I'm sure we'll probably have the Chief Inspector in at some stage anyway. She She's very open to, to meet with the committee. But just in relation to the issue on CSUs around um, whether or not it is solitary confinement, and I know there 
there's some disagreement around this issue and, and obviously from the description that you laid out at that point said and I don't think that you would agree it's solitary confinement but I suppose maybe that's one of the things that could be addressed in this and, and again we could raise that with the criminal justice and inspectorate because it has been described as solitary confinement and as you would know by a number of organisations particularly human rights organisations and by a previous prison ombudsman so I suppose just for for clar brief clarity around that particular issue I would appreciate that yeah. I mean, people who are at the CSU, to be clear, are not in solitary confinement in the way it would be defined in international law. People who are in the CSU, yes, they are separated from other prisoners um, for their own safety and for the safety of other prisoners, but they are engaged throughout the day um, by prison officers and staff of the prisons. They are engaged um, throughout their time um, by others who will work with them, whether that's members from the Health Trust um, or other bodies that are there in support of them, because the purpose of CSU is to do exactly what it says, to care and supervise, um, care for and supervise um, those prisoners um, in, in a different setting because of particular behavioural issues or risks um, attendant to that particular prisoner. And so it would be not categorised as solitary confinement. I mean, I was able to see the exercise yard where people are able to um, have the opportunity, <coughs> pardon me, to, <coughs> to exercise. People are able um, to be taken for walks um, with prison officers. Prison officers will spend time with each of the prisoners. And I spoke with officers who work in the unit when I visited, and they will spend time with each of the prisoners um, over a period in order that they're able to engage with them, find out what their needs are, and ensure that if there are issues um, around um, their concerns or if there's stress or whatever, that it's properly managed. There's also a lot of work has gone on to ensure the prisoners who come to CSU, <coughs> pardon me, to come into the CSU um, that their activities, if you like, that they left when they came to CSU. So things like their education program um, and other activities that they've been involved in within the prisons, that those are charted and recorded um, and that those are then picked up again when people leave so that they're able to re-enter the main population as soon as possible, but also as seamlessly as possible. Um, and a lot of work has been done on that. So, I mean, it's not solitary confinement. If you look at the, the definition of solitary confinement, um, it would involve people being on their own for long periods of time. They are constantly engaged throughout the day um, by prison officers um, and by other members of the prison staff team. Um, and it is somewhere where they get um, care and supervision as opposed to simply left to their own devices. Um, and, you know, there is a, a genuine attempt um, with the work that goes on in CSU in order to deal with the particular issues that the person has faced that have led them to be there and to try and resolve those as quickly as possible and return them um, to the main population. I'm aware that some people have spoken out about this. Some of those people will not necessarily have ever visited the CSU. I think there's a, there's a particular issue about that where people won't necessarily have seen what's happening there. I mean, I've seen the accommodation. It's really no different um, to that which you would find in other parts of the prison, other than that there are a number of dry cells there for um, for, for, for reasons, obviously, um, around drugs um, and so on. But apart from that, it's a pretty standard setup um, in terms of, of the, the prison um, standard of accommodation. And the idea that this is in some way substandard, subhuman, accommodation is actually an insult to the prison service people's dignity when they're in the csu is just as valuable and just as a, just as big a priority um, to prison service and to me as when they're in the rest of the prison population and it's important that we treat people um, with dignity um, regardless um, of their conduct and behavior when they're in the prison because i think the first step in rehabilitation um, is treating people with dignity and respect um, and then trying to instill in them some sense of self-worth that will allow them to rehabilitate successfully uh, when they leave the prison. So it's a complex area um, and it's a difficult job. But I have to say that the officers with whom I met um, who work in CSU take great pride in the work that they do there and are glad to see prisoners who have come through um, the unit able to be rehabilitated into the main population um, and successfully so. And of course, I mean, all of, I think all of the committee recognise that prison is dealing with, um, I suppose, a microcosm of many of the problems that we face in society. Um, we often are dealing with people with very complex needs, people who are incredibly volatile, um, and also people who can be incredibly violent. And so there is a complex mix. But I think if you look back to the period 
where the prison, particularly McGabry, but indeed other prisons, got a fairly bad um, reputation as unsafe places to be. Um, I think the contrast now that the CSUs are being managed in a very different way, but also being utilised to deal with those behaviour problems in a constructive way, I think the contrast in terms of wider prisoner safety and stability has been significant. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that we do have a duty not only to the prisoners in the CSU, but to the wider population within the prison. They deserve to be able to serve their sentence in peace. Um, as undisturbed as possible and without the threat of, of violence um, or disruption. And it's hugely important to the prison um, service that that's able to take place for the safety of other prisoners and indeed for the safety of prison officers. So it is an un, it's, a, it's a necessary thing that we have the CSU, um, but it's also important that we learn um, from whatever recommendations um, Sajini might choose to bring forward in terms of how we improve what we do in the CSU. Because the one thing that I have found in working with prison services is that they are always open to improvement. And I think that that is the best kind of organisation you can work with. No, I, I appreciate that, Minister. And I think improvement can be for both the prisoners and, and the staff. So I'm, I'm sure that they, they will be hopeful that Sajini will look at, at both sides of it, to be fair. Just for very quickly, my, my own final point, Ministry, you offered to, to keep us updated in relation to the pension scheme, and I would really appreciate being kept updated on what's happening with that, because you're right, those people out there that are waiting on this and that have been waiting on this and campaigning for, for, for very many years really want to, to know what's happening, and they are anxious and they are nervous, and I totally understand where they're coming from, and I, and I, I feel the same anxiety because I am concerned about where the funding is coming from. And and that's why I outlined at the very outset in, in that portion of our meeting. My real concern at this the derogation of duty by the British actors who have done indeed the British government and the mess about they've done in relation to this issue, in, in my opinion, has been disgraceful and with no thought for the victims or, or for those out there who, who, who are waiting on this and who are looking to, to, to see if it'll be resolved. So I appreciate both yourself and the, and the permanent actor coming to the meeting today. Thank you very much and thank you for responding to all of the the issues and I'm sure we'll see you back in front of us again soon. But thank you and thank you for well, members thank for you Billy, um, and to yourself and to the chairman uh, for uh, managing up through what was a fairly weighty list of issues um, in reasonably good time. So thank you very much for that. And of course, I'm happy to come back to the committee um, as and when um, we, that, that's required or requested. So um, thank you for that and I appreciate the questions. Thank you. Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.